Hi, I'm Mike Gilliam. Science in You starts now. I'm Mike Gilliam. The internet is changing our lives in ways we never could have imagined, especially in the ways that we get our news and entertainment. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. The internet is an amazing tool, but when seeking medical advice, it's like any other tool. You have to know how to use it. That's ahead on Science and You. Hey, I'm Erna Beldamillo. I'm inside the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So next time you come visit here, don't forget your smartphone. I'll explain why, coming up on Science and You. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz, and I am sick of creepers. So I am building a portal and heading to the nether. A translation of that sentence is coming up with a look at Minecraft. Ahead on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. In our high-tech world is the low-tech art of face-to-face -face conversation getting lost. A closer look at the internet and social skills ahead on Science and You. This tiny chip can help you track down a missing pet. I'm Grant Greenberg, and that's ahead on Science and You. When it comes to technology, the internet has certainly changed our lives. And that's very evident when we look at the ways that we get our entertainment and our news. Use of the internet has exploded. I use the internet every morning to read newspapers and to check out the news. A lot of movie watching through Netflix. Um, the, we use it as our primary source for uh, finding out about current events, news, sports, things of that sort. I use it for, for any entertainment, for social media purposes. Uh -huh. um, when you say entertainment, what do you mean? Uh, YouTube. Yeah, I don't have a TV. I haven't had a TV in like 10 years, so if I want to watch TV, it's on, it's on my laptop. You can see just about everything online. Brendan Kerner is a contributing editor for Wired Magazine and has an up-close look at the seismic technology shift that has brought the Internet into seemingly every corner of our lives. I think you can argue that it's basically the most fundamental and revolutionary change to human society over the past 15 to 20 years. Guys in my office say they start their day online. First thing in the morning, I boot up my computer. I usually check my email, log on to Twitter. I'll usually check uh, ESPN. I'll check out Facebook occasionally. Head to CNN sometimes to see what their headlines are. Anything breaking news. But usually Twitter keeps me uh, you know, on top of things. And if anything actually happens in the world, that I can see it through here. Wired Magazine's Kerner says, for many, Facebook and Twitter are their first sources for news and information. It's a new way of obtaining your news because you get it from so many different streams, and it's coming from trusted sources, your friends, who are filtering in and out what they think is important. So I feel for a lot of people, it's a much more immediate way to get news and information than going to a traditional newspaper website, uh, as some people still do, of course. But it's a way you know you're going to get the, uh, the information and data that's important to the people that you care about and that you trust. Same thing with Twitter? Very much so. And I'm the kind of person who checks Twitter first thing in the morning. And it's the same thing. It's a constant feed of information. And I know that the people I follow are people whose judgment and curatorial abilities I trust to give me the most important information. Technology has changed the dissemination of news. And Kerner says more changes are on the way. Where do you see news going as far as the internet is concerned in the next, say, five years? I mean, do you think that it will be more driven by social media, or do you think that there will be a change in the way the newspapers, the magazines handle their content? Well, you see right now there's been an integration of the two in a lot of ways. You see uh, traditional news organizations getting much smarter and more proactive about the way they deal with social media and handle it. And understanding that the way to get their content uh, circulated among people is to leverage social media to their advantage. At the same time, I think there's a real appetite for what traditional news organizations bring to the table, which is the expertise of reporting, information gathering, and storytelling. Um, so I think there's going to be an amalgamation of those two forces, traditional news gathering and also social media, to make something very, very powerful. The Internet is also driving changes in the field of entertainment, including the streaming of content. 
It's funny to think that when Netflix launched, their whole model was mailing you DVDs you know, through the US Postal Service. And obviously, that already seems archaic um, just a few years down the line. Um, certainly, streaming of entertainment, streaming of content is the future. You can see all the major media players and tech players trying to get into this space, people like Google, um, trying to get people to stream to, to TV. Um, so that's going to be the big trend for the next couple of years, is abandoning uh, physical storage of entertainment strictly in favor of streaming content. And that is allowing people to view content on their own terms. For our ADD generation, we can have our TV on one side, we can be typing on the other side, still looking stuff up. They could also binge watch TV, viewing a whole season of a show in just a few days, instead of checking in week after week. Actors and producers are also taking their content directly to viewers on YouTube. Soap opera star Michelle Stafford left The Young and the Restless and now has her own comedy series on YouTube. She even addressed the massive change in her first episode. You're seeing it a lot. Obviously, there's no filter or conduit. There's no middleman if you want to do that. It's really um, streaming your own creativity to the end user, and you can gain a very large following. And obviously, on YouTube, you can monetize through ads. So if you can get big enough of a following to, to watch your, your installments, you can actually make pretty good money doing it. But there's more. eBay has an app that allows viewers to purchase things that they see in their shows, like a toaster on the kitchen counter. And this has to do with the integration of the internet and TV, which is really the next great trend. And you see Google trying to take advantage of this by, by making this dongle that lets you kind of stream anything from your laptop to your TV screen. They want people basically to be interacting with uh, their TV programming through the internet at the same time. For exactly that reason, it increases the uh, monetization opportunities uh, for companies. Uh, if you see a product, you can buy it instantly. Um, so that's certainly the direction things are going right now in TV entertainment. Yeah. Which way are they trying to drive people, the entertainers? Are they trying to drive them to the internet, or are they trying to take them from the internet and drive them back to TV? Well, I think this is why we're trying to connect the two, right? You don't want them to be separate entities anymore. You want them to be a combination, all one thing kind of balled up together. Do you think that the internet will spell uh, the death of say cable TV? I think it's going to be very problematic for cable TV. I think it's going to increase the demands for a la carte programming. I think people no longer will be confined to these bundles where they have, they only want two or three channels, but they get 500 others they never want to watch. It's going to create great pressure um, from consumers, and that's going to filter up as you know people who are becoming lawmakers that are in their 20s now are going to become lawmakers in their 30s and 40s and are going to understand uh, consumer gripes about the current situation with the kind of monopolistic uh, way that the cable industry is structured. So I think that's certainly going to be uh, something the cable industry will have to respond to. One of the big things that have been talked about is unbundling. I think the other problem for them is, will someone like Netflix become a viable competitor in the cable space? Uh, you know, certainly see Netflix going to original programming. Uh, a lot of services, Amazon, going to original programming as well, uh, trying to get people to cut the cord on cable in favor of using Amazon or Netflix exclusively. That's going to be a major challenge for cable providers. We've gotten to the point now where we've got three iPads in the house, a big screen TV, a desktop back there. Where is all of this going to go in the next five years? Well, I think it's exciting. I think it's going to give people more of an outlet for their creativity and to express themselves and to interact with one another and people they maybe would never meet otherwise in life. And I think that's really powerful and good for society as a whole. What do you think it means, though, for news and entertainment? Well, I think it's going to be challenging, but I have no doubt that people are going to still want to be entertained or still going to want to know about the world around them. So I, I really have a lot of faith that organizations will figure out a way to make it work. Wow. With all the changes that the Internet has driven over just the last few years, one can only imagine what the future holds. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. The internet is an amazing tool, but you have to know how to use it when seeking medical advice. We've become a nation of do-it-yourself doctors. The Pew Research Center reports some 80% of internet users turn to the web for health advice, and there's plenty of it. We search for symptoms and relief from the common cold, arthritis and stiff joints, back pain, breathing problems, allergies, flu, you name it and you'll likely find it. But where is the information coming from? Is the site accurate or are they selling something? The Medical Library Association offers simple guidelines to keep in mind when seeking advice on medical websites. Can you easily identify the site sponsor? Sponsorship helps establish the site as respected and dependable. 
Does the site list advisory board members or consultants? This will offer further insight on the credibility of the published information. And the site should be updated frequently, with the date of the latest revision clearly posted. The medical information should be presented in a clear manner and presented as fact, not opinion. Dr. Maxim Shulamovich, attending physician at the Brooklyn Hospital Center, says despite instant access to digital health information, it's important for the consumer to understand when they're reading advertising copy. So doctor, when, when you're looking for a proper medical website, what should a patient look for? Look for the websites that end in .gov, .org, and not .com. And the reasons I, I, I basically that the .gov and .org websites are not likely to be uh, for profit. They are held, maintained by physicians often and are meant to teach, not meant to sell you a product. What is your, your biggest challenge as a physician with a, pa with a patient who comes in and says, before I tell you anything, this is what I know I have because the internet told me. The challenge is to, is to deal with an overwhelmed patient who has received so information that they really are not very well informed. And a misinformed health seeker could become entangled in a detrimental cycle of fear, panic, and self-diagnosis. For a person who is a hypochondriac by nature, say, is self-diagnosis a dangerous way to do so on the internet? For a hypochondriac, this is an absolute time suck, in a way. A lot of the for-profit websites um, do create a sense of, 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 of panic, panic, of hysteria even, over a lot of, of what usually are benign symptoms. For a hypochondriac, it is especially dangerous. I also think that it's, it's um, unrealistic to expect the patients not to use the internet because it is so easy and it's, it's, it's so vast. You're obviously not saying don't go to these sites ever, but what is the happy medium? Is it to use it in conjunction with a physician? I do think so. Come prepared, come with questions. Open-minded, come open-minded and with questions. Dr. Shulamovich believes that all of us should be as informed as we can be about health issues, but answers found on the internet should be taken with a grain of salt. Even if you think you've found the answer to your symptoms, always seek the advice of a doctor. I'm Magali Laguerre-Wilkinson for Science and You. Hey, I'm Bernabel DeMillo. I'm inside the Metropolitan Museum of Art, surrounded by history. So what role does Facebook and Instagram have at this place? Well, let's just ask the museum's first chief digital officer. Sri Srinivasan, a veteran journalist, educator, and social media guru, was tapped recently by the Met CEO Tom Campbell to lead the museum's social, mobile, and online strategy. So, Edgar Degas, welcome to the world of Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Museums all over the world, large and small, are going digital to reach out to a larger audience and to make their collections accessible to all. Museums initially use social media to advertise exhibits or upcoming events. Now they are using technology in a more interactive way, from virtual exhibits to user-generated content. Srinivasan, well known for his work as a digital journalist, said it made sense for a journalist, a storyteller, to make this transition to the art world. The opportunity to work in the digital space, to continue to tell stories, if we have hundreds of thousands of uh, pieces of art, then each one of them can tell a story, and we, wanna, we want that story told to as many people as possible. The Met does a great job telling these stories digitally, taking advantage of multimedia technology from blogs to social media and videos. One of the media team's latest project is 82nd and 5th, where art lovers and historians can actually hear from the curators. The Met is not the only museum using social media and technology to expand its reach beyond museum walls. There is the Museum of Modern Art, 
and its popular multimedia page. The Brooklyn Museum's Instagram page has more than 55,000 followers and almost half a million Twitter followers. Can't make it to the Philadelphia Murals Arts Program? No worries, it's all online. And you don't need a passport to visit the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam. You can discover Anne Frank's hiding places in this interactive tour created by the museum's digital team. And there is tech giant Google, also helping to preserve and digitize art and history through its Google Cultural Institute. Google has partnered with hundreds of museums and cultural institutions around the world, bringing some of the art world's most treasured collections alive and connecting it with the digital audience. But some wonder if technology will keep people from experiencing the art and history in person. Srinivasan believes it will have the opposite effect. He calls it a virtuous circle. You see it, you know, on your Instagram page, on your Twitter feed, or maybe on Facebook, and you think, you know, one day I hope to travel and be able to see that in person. Because the, diff uh, the, the experience is definitely different, right, from seeing it digitally and also seeing it in person. Sure. Some people uh, have asked me, actually, if you make the online experience so good, will people then want to even bother to come? Um, I think that and what people will say is, gee, the online experience is, is so good, imagine how much better it'll be in person. Even at a time when there's so much technology, when there's so much digital stuff all around us, I'm finding that people want to have physical experiences. They want to go. They want to get as close to things as possible. They, they want to experience it themselves. In fact, the Met, like many other museums, encourages user-generated content. The Met wants people to take pictures and post their photos online, even selfies. Also wired the entire museum for Wi-Fi, and there's free Wi-Fi where, wherever you are in the building. And uh, that's all part of this uh, idea to uh, connect with people the way they want to connect and encouraging them to uh, capture what they're seeing and then share and tell their stories to their friends. So next time you visit the Met, don't forget your smartphone. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Science and You. Hi, I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz for Science and You. If you've got kids, you've got video games. A national study found that the average American kid plays video games for 13.2 hours per week. A lot of that time has been gobbled up by a game called Minecraft. Minecraft was created by Swedish game programmer Notch Pearson. The game was released to the public in 2009. As of the end of 2013, with no advertising at all, the game has sold over 33 million copies across all platforms. And now, all those creepers and mobs from Minecraft are invading middle school classrooms. I'm here with Michael Dominico, a 6th and 7th grade teacher at Quest to Learn, a New York City public school affectionately nicknamed the Video Game School. Michael's class is called Sports for the Mind. It covers game design and media arts. Today we're lucky. We are using Minecraft in class. Yeah! For the uninitiated, mm -hmm. what is Minecraft? Well, Minecraft is a procedurally generated sandbox game. And, and what I mean by that is when the kids start playing, they will go through this three-dimensional world and the algorithm that is this world starts creating things at random. I mean, it's really open to any kind of interpretation, which I think that's why the kids like it. It's completely open-ended. So what's the point of Minecraft? I took that question to an expert. I suppose in creative mode, it's to build something beautiful or something you're proud of. And what do you like about Minecraft? Probably the sense of accomplishment after building something ridiculous. What is it about the game that made it appropriate for a sixth grade class? A lot of the students have a strong understanding of how to use the application because they use it all the time. So they took their knowledge of Minecraft and they started designing through Minecraft ancient Greece and ancient Roman temples. And, and those temples really pop and they came to life in Minecraft. I mean, the, the program is, is really fantastic and it really allows them to kind of have to create very beautiful buildings. So it's kind of like what, what we used to make out of sugar cubes, except we were limited by how many cubes your mother would let you use. In Minecraft, you're only limited by your imagination. Yeah, so the way the, the game works is that while you're mining or digging, you gain um, inventory, um, be it uh, wood or 
types of stone, and you can use that stone or wood or whatever it happens to be to create these buildings, these, these like homes, or whatever the kids want to create, or whatever you want to create at the time. In a video game universe full of beautiful images, Minecraft is made up of grossly pixelated cubes. So you gotta wonder, why do kids like those cubes so much? It, it evens the playing field. It really does even the playing field. We're all working with the same cube, right? right. So if we're all working with the same cube, how could I make my cubes better than yours? Or how can I make my cubes good for me? And that impulse to build something fantastic has always been a part of childhood. Minecraft and games like it are the cultural descendants of blocks and Lincoln Logs and Lego. But because it's in the digital world, the resources are infinitely acquirable and the terrain is limitless and there's nothing to clean up when you're done. This has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. There's no question the internet has changed our world and enhanced our lives. But what about social skills? Is today's high-tech generation getting enough low-tech face-to-face time? Do you want something to drink? Do you want some water? An after-school snack and a chance to catch up with her daughter Nina. Mom Danny Davis is a big believer in the age-old art of conversation. But like a lot of parents, she worries about that getting lost in today's technology-consumed world. And then you see parents getting frustrated with their children at the holidays because they didn't walk up to Uncle Irving and shake his hand and look him in the eye and say, how are you? It's so nice to see you. They haven't been taught to do that. They don't have the repetitive energy around conversation and communicating in person. So just how connected are today's kids? According to a survey by the Pew Research Center, some 95% of teens ages 12 to 17 are online. 81% of online teens use some kind of social media. And 78% have cell phones. Kirsten Cullen Sharma is a neuropsychologist at NYU Langone's Child Study Center. If kids are using technology and that's at the expense of personal interactions, then we know that they're not getting as much practice with social interactions. So people talk about social skills, right, and social skills development. That's such a hot topic nowadays. And the word skill is so important because it's just like anything else. In order to get good at it, you need to have a lot of practice. So a huge part of social communication is understanding people's facial expressions, understanding their tone of voice, and, and really being able to respond immediately to what somebody's saying to you. And the way that we communicate through technology is just very different than interpersonally. Dr. Colin Sharma explains research studying the potential impact of technology on the brain is a big area of interest right now. But she points out there are things about brain development we already know. The main part of the brain that is responsible for making decisions and making judgment is that prefrontal area. We know it's not completely developed until our mid-20s. We really want to work with parents on how they structure the use of technology and the use of media because, again, with that part of the prefrontal area with children um, still developing until their mid-20s, we can't always rely on them to make decisions for themselves or to make the best judgment about how much is too much or like when to stop. Of course, technology has its benefits, whether that's as a learning tool or simply a way for parents and kids to stay in touch. Danny says part of the balance in her home is device downtime for everyone, including adults. If I want to make sure this behavior is happening, I need to model it. I need to model, hey, when everybody's home and everybody's around, we are together. This is our time to be together. This is not our time to be checking in on our devices and our computers and, and checking out you know, what's going on outside of home. Okay. He says just put it down. It's family time. Family time. Family time. And that's important. Yes. Do you think it's important even though I bet it might bug you at some moments? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Bottom line for a lot of parents, moderation is key when it comes to kids and the internet. Technology with an old-fashioned dose of grown-up oversight. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. I'm Grant Greenberg for Science and You. Let's say your pet is missing and his collar falls off. Well, now simple technology can help you get him back. Stats show one in every three family pets will at some point get lost. A hard fact not lost on Norman Mohi. Mohi, a software entrepreneur, is a former aerospace engineer whose company is developing a way to track a lost dog through GPS technology. He calls it search, spelled with a C. 
Search essentially is a software download on the three major um, wireless platforms such as iPhone, Android, and BlackBerry. Its purpose is to allow mobile-to-mobile -mobile tracking between those devices. When a small pager is fitted to the dog's collar, Moe's software can track it well beyond a simple dot on a map. A traditional dot on a map may not be very, very helpful in finding them. What Search does that is different is that in addition to the dot on the map, it has a patented feature that points in the direction of the person or in this case being a pet that you're looking for relative to where you are and where you're facing and headed. Like a compass pointing north, the arrow on display points directly to your lost dog and measures an exact distance right over your phone. Search as a technology will allow you to find anyone or anything including pets very easily, accurately. While Search is now undergoing field tests, a proven way to recover your lost pet is presently available at your local vet. What we're going to do is we're going to inject this little microchip that's about the size of a piece of rice under the skin in between her shoulder blades. And hopefully we're going to do that without her noticing. So we'll see how this goes. All right. Ready, sweetie? Oh, she's so brave. Little poke. What was that? What was that? That was it. It takes a second and a half. It's in already. A second and a half is all it takes to ensure your pet comes back home. We visited the Somerset Veterinary Group in East Bridgewater, New Jersey to get a closer look. Basically, a microchip is not that much different than getting a routine vaccine. It's, uh, you know, the needle's a little bit bigger, but not much, and really they don't mind very much getting chipped. Six to eight million pets a year enter U.S. shelters. Many are lost family dogs or cats who ran off or just got lost but they can be happily reunited with their families through the science of microchip technology. Linda Block is with Home Again, a pet recovery service who believes the most important gift you can give your pet is a microchip. It utilizes RFID technology, radio frequency identification. So basically just a radio wave comes out of a reader and picks up a unique identifier in the microchip. A scanner like this one will indicate the presence of the chip containing your personal identification code as registered in the database of the recovery service. In the database at a pet recovery service like Home Again, that's where you would put your contact information, your sister's contact information, your mother's contact information, a photo, medical information, behavior information that you would want whoever's finding your pet to know to be able to take care of your pet. So that if your dog gets lost, any vet, animal control, shelter can help find you and reunite you with your pet. Getting your pet chipped is smart, and easy on your budget. It's not painful, requires no anesthesia or surgery, there's no hospital stay, there are no batteries, it doesn't move around, and it's permanent. The average cost of implanting a microchip by a veterinarian is approximately $40, $45. Included in that is the registration of the microchip, and then there's an annual fee of $16.99. When you register a microchip, you're, you get lifetime registration in our database. Every dog, every pet should be chipped. A tiny chip or satellite tracking. Either way, we can have our pets where they belong, with us. I'm Grant Greenberg for Science and You. That's our show for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mike Gilliam. See you next time on Science and You.